everyone? Good morning. I'm very happy to see that you all got the message. We tried in a number of ways to make sure that you found out that today we're having one service at nine and here you all are right on time. I was out in the lobby at 8.15 and I was very happy to note that there was nobody coming in the door. <laughs> so it means that we got at least the word out to, to most folks. Uh, really glad to have you here this morning. Of course, you know this is a special Sunday because not only are we having a single service right now, we're also having our annual meeting directly following. So uh, great to have you all with us. And don't, don't forget to go downstairs for coffee this morning. And then downstairs we'll have our meeting. There's one more thing we're doing this morning that's kind of a special thing. We were looking for a time to say thank you to our preschool and learning center director, Jean Cunningham. She has chosen to step aside and some, do some other things. And uh, she just finished her work on the 19th. And she's a very shy person, doesn't like to be in the limelight. And I said, we're going we're gonna to have a time to say thank you. And you just have to kind of screw up your courage and, and do that. And she said, OK. <laughs> so, but she's at her church this morning. She's a, a Roman Catholic, and she's teaching. She said, I could get there about 10, 15. I said, well, that'd be great. That's when our service ends. So I've got people in the back on the lookout for Jean when she comes in at 10, 15. And if she gets here in time before we dismiss, we're going to have our little thank you time together here before we have our, our closing uh, benediction. If she doesn't get here before we dismiss, then we'll do it downstairs, okay? So be prepared for me to try to get everybody's attention while you're having coffee, and we'll do it downstairs. But we're going to say thanks to Jean this morning, and uh, that'll be a neat part of our time together. Uh, Todd Lewis is in Houston this morning. He is at the ELCA youth training event, uh, youth leader training event. He goes every year. It's a wonderful event, and, and Todd is there with our prayers and our best wishes. There's some interesting things going on today after the annual meeting. Uh, for those of you who are fans of the Luther College Choir, they're singing in Wausau at 4 o'clock. And um, Oz, are you going? Are you and Lois going? Thought you would. <laughs> um, if anybody else wants to know where to go, I'm sure Oz and Lois will be glad to tell you. Uh, so talk with them uh, over coffee. And uh, that'll be in Wausau, 4 o'clock. The Luther College Choir is spectacular, and you'll love that if you are able to go. The other thing that's happening today is this evening, we're doing the first of our um, monthly uh, film, uh, film series on the Reformation. This is part of our commemoration of the 500th anniversary. And tonight, our first film is going to be the Rick Steves travel documentary on Luther and the Lutherlands and the story of the Reformation. Um, that's something that he developed specifically for this event for the ELCA. He's an ELCA member, as you may know. I lives out in Seattle. and. Um, he made this special gift uh, for the ELCA Lutheran Church and for all other denominations as well. So we're going to see that tonight at 6.30, right here. So please come, and um, we're going to have popcorn, and we're going to have um, uh, Ed Klusman is going to make apple strudel. Is that already made, Ed? It's all ready to go. <laughs> so come on tonight. It's going to be a really neat film, followed by a little discussion, and then some, some good fellowship. And uh, that's at 6.30 tonight. We've got a, uh, a new song that starts our worship service to, today. It's, it's a contemporary song that the band has been working on. And they're going to sing the whole thing, and we're, they're going to ask us to sing on the refrain. The refrain is really quite straightforward, and the words are, Jesus is the light of the world. Jesus is the light of the world. Jesus is the light of the world. Come on, let him shine on me. And I asked Darcy to play it once through, just the chorus. <coughs> is the light of the world. Jesus is the light of the world. Jesus is the light of the world. Come on, let it shine on me. Jesus is the light of the world. Jesus is the light of the world. Jesus is the light of the world. Come on, let it shine on me. Then the, the uh, band will sing the, the verses and we'll come back and sing the refrain. And one final word about our service this morning. Um, somebody made a very good suggestion during the course of the week that during the flu season, it might be prudent if we not use the common cup. So for the next several weeks, maybe a month or so, we decided it might be healthier for us all to use the little cups and to gather around the altar. So even though ordinarily on Praise Band Sunday we would do the intinction version, we thought for a few weeks we would play it safe and use the small common 
uh, the, the small individual cups. And also during the passing of the peace, you might be encouraged rather than shaking hands, maybe to just touch somebody's shoulder or elbow, just to keep our germs to ourselves. Um, because as we've all heard, the, the flu this season is particularly nasty. So uh, you might want to just exercise that time. We'll still do the sharing of the peace. We'll just try to do it a little more hygienically than usual. All right, yes. Thank you, I almost forgot. I am very happy to tell you, my friends, that because of your great assistance, I will be the next guest director of the Central Wisconsin Symphony Orchestra. <laughs> I was writing down the announcements this morning and I had a nagging feeling that I forgot to write something down, but thanks, Carol, for, for reminding me. The concert is going to be on February 17th, that's Saturday night, February 18th, the same concert, two, two days in a row, at 4 p.m. Of course, you're all invited. I really want to emphasize this. The margin of my victory in this fundraising contest is just about identical to the margin of, of donations that came from the congregation. So I had that ace in the hole and the others didn't. I had a whole congregation <laughs> to, to tell about. And you responded beautifully, and that's exactly the amount by which I won. So thank you very much to all of you. It's going to be a wonderful concert, and I've, I'm going to be directing something that I think is very fitting. Usually they do something as kind of a joke, but I thought it'd be a really great chance to do something serious. So Mendelssohn wrote a thing called the Reformation Symphony, and the fourth movement of the Reformation Symphony is a mighty fortress. And so that's what I'm going to do on that weekend. So that's about a month away, and you're all invited to the concert, of course. Uh, but thank you so much for your support. It really was a lot of fun. And my goal for having the community gain awareness of us through my participation has really worked beautifully. And I've had people all over town stop me and, and talk to me about it and talk about the church and all of that. So that's been really a neat, a neat thing for all of us uh, and a lot of fun for me. So thanks so much for helping me achieve that goal. And we'll all uh, enjoy that concert. Um, the 17th and 18th of February. Okay. And yes. Marty. Please. Let me borrow the microphone. There you go. So, how do we tell the story of Jesus? <clears throat> Any volunteers? How did Jesus tell the story? Stories and parables. That's, that's what he used. He, he taught with energy, with excitement, with authority, right? The people in Jesus' day had, uh, you know, only could hear the words. There was nothing written down. There were no cell phones. So the first generation only could hear the story. And today is an event over at the uh, Frame, Memorial. Frame Memorial Church. Thank you, somebody. <laughs> <laughs> at 3 o'clock, there's a, a, ge a gentleman, a, a pastor, um, who is currently associate minister uh, in Eau Claire, at one of the churches. And he has taken the lifelong mission of memorizing the Gospels. And he will dramatize and tell it with authority and with energy and with excitement and speak the story of Mark, the whole gospel. You'd be in for a real treat. So I encourage you, with all the busy stuff going on today, to take time to listen to F F Phil, Phil Ruge Jones. So. Is that good? Yes, thank you, Marty. Thank you. So, uh, no shortage of things to do today, all of which are wonderful. And uh, Marty and I got a chance to hear him do a little bit for pastors the other day. He's really remarkable. And listening to the telling of the whole Gospel of Mark in one setting is, is really a profound experience. So, lots of choices today, but we hope that you'll stay for the annual meeting and see you tonight. And whatever else you can squeeze in, it'll be wonderful. And it's okay to have this many announcements because I'm trying to stretch so that Gene Cunningham gets here in time. <laughs> but I think we, we've got one more. Yes, Carol. Uh, because of the flu, there is a need for blood. And uh, the American Red Cross is having a blood drive tomorrow morning at 7 o'clock. Uh, we would like to 
Could you say it on Thursday? St. Paul's Tomorrow Methodist. At the Tomorrow at the Plover Municipal Building. Thank you for that important announcement. Are there any others? Okay, well, we are going to then begin worship with our first song. Please rise.
be with you. Let us pray. Compassionate God, you gather the whole universe into your radiant presence and continually reveal your Son as our Savior. Bring wholeness to all that is broken and speak truth to us in our confusion that all creation will see and know your Son, Jesus Christ, our Savior and Lord. Amen. Todd is gone today, so it's my turn to do the children's message, and I'd like to invite the kids forward. And here they come with eagerness. Fantastic. Hi, kids. Kids of all sizes. It's wonderful. Good morning. Now, I have some interesting objects here. See these? I'm going to pass this around. As I pass this around, I want to ask you a question. Do you kids pray sometimes? Do you say prayers sometimes? Yes? Yeah. And when you say prayers, who do you pray to? Uh, Got to wait till these objects go around here. Isn't that interesting? <laughs> go. When you say prayers, who do you pray to? Thank you. Who do you pray to? Pray to God, right? And sometimes we pray to Jesus, right? Now, suppose I said that when you pray, you should pray to these things. What would you think about that? Would that feel wrong? Yeah, it would feel wrong, wouldn't it? To pray to some silly objects like this? Um, this is a, a piece of pot that my daughter made. It hangs in my office. Do you think it's pretty? No, it's kind of ugly, isn't it? <laughs> She's got a knack for making really ugly faces, and she, she always used to do that as a kid and, and draw on the, to make ugly faces of her grandfather. And so she made this for me to hang in my office. Now, let's pretend that this is something called Baal, okay? And here's another little statue, and let's pretend that this one is called Isis, okay? Those are funny names, but years and years ago, people used to have this strange idea that you could pray to objects objects made out of clay or made out of stone, and they were called false gods. And people thought you could pray to those things. So you might say, if you pray to this for good weather, you might get good weather. If you pray to this for blessings and money in life, then that would happen. Do you think that really works? If you prayed to this, do you think it would work? Probably not, right? If you prayed to something silly like that, that wouldn't make any sense. If you prayed to something like this, would that make any sense? No, because we pray to God, right? We learn to pray to God because the Bible tells us that God is with us in heaven and he hears all of our prayers all the time. Well, in our story today from the Bible, we're going to hear about silly things like some people were praying to. So I wanted to bring you something so you could see what it looked like. Silly things, silly objects that some people made with their hands and they're not real gods, are they? No, there's only one real God, and God is in heaven. And he's the one we pray to all the time. So let's do that now, shall we? Can we fold our hands and say a prayer to God? God, we know you're in heaven, and we know that you listen to all our prayers. We thank you for all the blessings you give us in our life. And we ask you to help us remember to pray, for you, pray to you every day. We pray in Jesus' name. Amen. Well, thank you for coming and looking at Baal and Isis for me today. Good morning. Good morning. The Old Testament reading this morning comes to us from Deuteronomy, the 18th chapter, beginning with the 15th verse. This was a time when the Israelites were getting ready to enter the land of Canaan, and Moses was getting pretty old, and the people were concerned about how would they know the will of God once Moses died. Yeah, this is their answer. Moses said, The Lord your God will raise up for you a prophet like me from among your own people. 
You shall heed such a prophet. This is what you requested of the Lord your God at Horeb on the day of the assembly when you said, If I hear the voice of the Lord my God any more or ever see again this great fire, I will die. Then the Lord replied to me, They are right in what they have said. I will raise up for them a prophet like you from among their own people. I will put my words in the mouth of the prophet who shall speak to them everything that I command. Anyone who does not heed the words that the prophet shall speak in my name, I myself will hold accountable. But any prophet who speaks in the name of other gods, or who presumes to speak in my name a word that I have not commanded the prophet to speak, that prophet shall die. The second reading today comes to us from the New Testament, from 1 Corinthians chapter 8, beginning with the first verse. Now Corinth at this time was a very pagan town, and when they were animal sacrificed during pagan rituals, the extra meat was sold on the market, and this created a conundrum and a confusion for the people following Christ. And Paul is answering that, that question. Now concerning food sacrificed to idols, we know that all of us possess knowledge. Knowledge puffs us up, but love builds up. Anyone who claims to know something does not yet have the necessary knowledge, but anyone who loves God is known by him. Hence, as to the eating of food offered to idols, we know that no idol in the world really exists, and, there is, and that there is no God but one. Indeed, even though there may be so-called gods in heaven or on earth, as in fact there are many gods and many lords, yet for us there is one God, the Father, from whom all things and for whom we exist, and one Lord Jesus Christ, through whom are all things and through whom we exist. It is not everyone, however, who has this knowledge. Since some have become so accustomed to idols until now, they still think of the food they eat as food offered to an idol, and their conscience, being weak, is defiled. Food will not bring us close to God. We are no worse off if we do not eat, and no better off if we do. But take care that this liberty of yours does not somehow become a st stumbling block to the weak. For if others see you, who possess knowledge, eating in the temple of an idol, might they not, since their conscience is weak, be encouraged to the point of eating food sacrificed to idols? So by your knowledge, those weak believers for whom Christ died are destroyed. But when you thus sin against members of your family and wound their conscience, when it is weak, you sin against Christ. Therefore, if food is a cause of their falling, I will never eat meat so that I may not cause one of them to fall. Here ends the reading. Please rise for the gospel reading. Our gospel reading today is taken from the first chapter of the gospel according to St. Mark. Jesus and his disciples went to Capernaum. And when the Sabbath came, he entered the synagogue and taught. They were astounded at his teaching, for he taught them as one having authority, and not as the scribes. Just then there was in their synagogue a man with a, an unclean spirit, and he cried out, What have you to do with us, Jesus of Nazareth? Have you come to destroy us? I know who you are, the Holy One of God. But Jesus rebuked him, saying, Be silent and come out of him. And the unclean spirit, convulsing him and crying with a loud voice, came out of him. They were all amazed, and they kept on asking one another, what is this? A new teaching with authority. He commands even the unclean spirits, and they obey him. At once, his fame began to spread throughout the surrounding region of Galilee. The Gospel of the Lord. Praise Praise Jesus Christ. Dear friends in Christ, grace and peace to you from God, our Heavenly Father, and our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. Amen. Have you ever taken a really close look at a bunch of grapes? Those are red grapes. But you notice there's a white coating on the outside of the grapes? Have you ever noticed that before? You know what that is? That white coating on the outside of a grape is yeast. Somehow, nature has figured out to make the grape juice on the inside 
the yeast on the outside, and guess what? When you crush a grape, what begins to happen? It starts to ferment, starts to turn into wine. So God created this perfect little wine factory in every grape. You crush a grape, and you don't just get grape juice, what you get is something that starts to ferment and becomes wine. Now, I've had a lot of conversations over the years with people from other congregations, other denominations, where they don't use wine in worship for, for Holy Communion. They use only grape juice. And you can imagine some good reasons, perhaps, for that. But it's been an interesting conversation. They say, well, you know, we use grape juice in our church because Jesus probably only used grape juice. He probably didn't really use wine. And I say, well, <laughs> you, you don't know how things work. <laughs> if you take a look at the grape, you'll see that the yeast is on the outside, the juice is on the inside. You crush the grape, you're going to get wine. So unless they had very sophisticated ways of keeping that fermentation to happen, which, of course, they didn't, all crushed grapes were going to be on their way to becoming wine, right? Now, I tried to talk with friends about that from different traditions, and they would still say, well, I don't believe that. And Okay, well, you can argue that for a long time, but I think the science is on my side. However, it occurs to me that it's probably not very wise to continue to argue and simply to let them choose their practice and let them do what they choose to do in their church, and we'll do what we choose to do in our church. In other words, even though I have knowledge that's based on some pretty good principles, it doesn't seem to make sense to let that be a division between us. So those who use only grape juice, that's fine. And I think we Lutherans would, would agree that God can, can indwell the grape juice just as well as God indwells the wine. So it doesn't seem to matter that much. In fact, we Lutherans use both grape juice and wine because some people prefer grape juice. And we think that when you take grape juice during communion, it's just the same and the, as good as taking wine. Now, I tell you that little, <clears throat> that little um, a bit about wine because uh, I'm trying to find something that comes close to something that we might understand that's near to what Paul was talking about when he was dealing with the Corinthians, trying to get them to understand this business about uh, meat sacrificed to idols. Now, you can imagine that new believers would be a little bit confused. First of all, you should know that in those days, there were false idols of all kinds. They probably weren't all this ugly, but this is probably a pretty good rep representation of what they were like. There were little statues, little stone things that were carved and sold, and you could buy a, a, a little god and have it in your house, or you could go to a, a temple and you could worship the god and they'd have a the God hanging in the wall, and you could have an altar there, and there would be meat sacrificed to, that, to that, God, that God, what we would call false God. In those days, there were different kinds of gods all over the place. There was a worship place on every street corner, and you could go to anyone you want. You might worship this God, then you might worship that God, you might worship this God, um, and they would sacrifice meat, sometimes to Isis, sometimes to Baal, and what have you. So it would be very common in those days to say, hey, Rick, why don't we go to your place of worship on Thursday night and get us a nice, of uh, the ISIS steak chop, the steakhouse, and we'll, and we'll get us a nice piece of meat. And then on Friday, why don't you come to my place, the Bale uh, chop house, and we'll, we'll get a nice pork tenderloin. So it was kind of a supper club. And people would do that all the time. They'd go to each other's places of worship. And there was all this meat. Now, of course, we would say, if you sacrifice meat to something that doesn't exist, it's no big deal. That's what Paul is arguing, actually. It's, it's not important to, to be concerned about whether the meat was sacrificed to something that doesn't exist. So Paul said, I'll eat that meat. Looks good to me. I'll take, a, I'll take a cut of that meat if I'm at the market, even though it says it was sacrificed to ISIS. But the new bel believers were a little confused because they were starting to take communion. And they realized in communion, this is supposed to represent Jesus' sacrifice for us. So there's a sacrifice in this new religion, just like there's a sacrifice in all the other religions. Hmm. So if we want to believe that there's one God and there was one sacrifice and we believe in Jesus and we take the bread and the wine, if that, that's what we believe, I better not eat this other meat sacrificed to false idols because it'll feel like I'm worshiping another God. And Paul says, don't worry about it. Doesn't matter. You can eat it. You don't have to eat it. Doesn't matter. But then he says, for those who are stronger in faith and who understand it, he says, you know, for the sake of those that aren't quite where we are, it probably is a good idea not to rub their noses in it. It's probably a good idea for us not to flaunt what we know, our knowledge, 
and to eat this meat in their presence because it will, it will hurt their conscience and it will drive, them, drive a wedge between them and their faith. So for the sake of love, rather than for the sake of better knowledge, this is how we should act. So that makes sense, doesn't it? So Paul wants us to know about the principle of love that is more important than the principle of knowledge. Doesn't matter what you know, you might know something that others don't know, but still for their sake, out of love for your brother or sister, we focus on something that's meaningful to them. So that's what Paul's talking about and this idea about the grape juice is, is about as close as I can come to thinking about a modern day analogy of it. Uh, I have a friend who meets with the Thursday morning Bible study. Some of us come there and we, there's a fellow named Dave Baker who's a former priest. And when we were talking about this, this lesson on, on Thursday morning, he shared something that I thought would be insightful for all of us because it's sort of another modern day parable of what Paul, what Paul is talking about here. You probably all know that on Friday, Catholics have been historically encouraged to eat fish, right? Well, why would they be encouraged to eat fish? Because, as Dave Baker tell, told us the other day, it's a way to set aside some of the more extravagant things, like a steak, <laughs> um, and focus on something that's simpler, a simple meal that's very uh, light and healthful. And as you do that, as you're fasting from your regular daily course of meat, what you want to do is use that as a spiritual exercise to focus on God and God's gifts and to spend a little bit more time and energy being prayerful and pious. That's a great idea. Lutherans would support that idea, although that's not our tradition. So that's the idea. If you eat fish on Fridays, then you're paying attention to the right kinds of things once a week in a very intentional way. And he said it, it got to be the case where if a Catholic person did eat meat on Friday, they called it a mortal sin. W what? A mortal sin? To have meat on, how many of you had meat on Friday? Yeah, a lot of us do. Uh, is it really a mortal sin? Well, here's where the idea comes in. We know that's not true. We know it's not a mortal sin. We know it's not something that will remove us from God's presence. We know it's not something that will make God angry at us, um, upset with us, disappointed. We know that's not really the case. But if you had the alternative to focus on a, a day of fasting and eating something simpler and lighter, more healthy, that makes sense. So we don't lord it over our Catholic brothers and sisters because they like to eat fish on Friday. In fact, here's what Dave Baker said. He said, what they've taken to doing is they go out to these all-you-can-eat fish buffets. <laughs> and it kind of kills the whole idea, doesn't it? You're not eating less, you're eating more. And you're not focusing on God, you're focusing on your, your uh, loosening your belt and, and getting as much as you can for your money. So that thing has kind of fallen apart a little bit, but the original idea is nice. And we Protestants are wise if we don't lord it over our knowledge about this being not being a mortal sin. We're wise if we don't lord it over any, any Catholic brothers or sisters who might still like to do that. So that's kind of a, a modern day example of that. And Paul's rule simply is this. We should think about what's loving for our brothers and sisters first before any knowledge we might have. Now what I'd like to do is go back and and talk about the wine for a second. I want to take a look at the grapes again. When you look at the grapes, you know that if you crush that grape, there's going to be some red liquid that comes out. And if you use your imagination, you can kind of imagine, well, that's kind of like the blood of Jesus. And maybe that's why Jesus chose to use wine, because it represents, or it looks like, in your imagination, something like blood. Now, of course, we know that it never does turn into blood. Even in Holy Communion, it stays wine, doesn't it? Now, we know that because, for one thing, we can taste it. For another thing, we know that the laws of physics don't work that way. There's an interesting thing that happened over the years, historically. In the Middle Ages, when the whole communion service was done before the Reformation, it was all done in Latin. And when the priest would stand at the altar, he would say these Latin words, hocus corpus meum, which means, this is my body. Hocus corpus meum. And the people listening out there, they couldn't understand Latin, so they would listen and they'd say, what was that? What, what was that? Hocus corpus meum. And so the word they heard was hocus pocus. <laughs> Interestingly, that's where the word hocus pocus comes from. And the idea was, if 
The priest said it over the wine, hocus corpus meum, hocus pocus. That was when the magic happened and the, and the grape juice or the wine would turn magically into blood. Isn't that interesting? Well, we know that that's not exactly what happens and that's not exactly what the, the church teaches in any place anymore. But you get the idea of how this could be very superstitious and magical, but it's not. It's simply something that God does as a, as a gift to us. Why the wine? We're not entirely sure, but we do know something. We do know that Jesus chose the wine to be the vehicle of his grace. We know that Jesus said, this wine is going to be the representative of my body, and whenever you drink it, you can think about me and the sacrifice I made. So, this is my body. And when we do that, when we take that wine together in communion, we remember that real sacrifice that Jesus made. In the same way, Jesus took a loaf of bread and he said, this is my body. Now, we know this is just ordinary bread. Tastes good, tastes just like bread. Nothing magical happens. But for some reason, Jesus chose the bread, this very common element, to be the thing that would be the vehicle of his grace. And so Jesus comes to us whenever we take the bread. Do this in remembrance of me, he said. And when we do, we remember the sacrifice that he really made for us. Now, we don't lord it over anyone else who has a different theology, even though we know this stays bread, this stays wine. But we trust God's promise that Jesus comes to us in the bread whenever we do this. It's a lovely promise, and it's a great reason for us to do communion on a very regular basis. So, we do this to remember Jesus' sacrifice. So as we come to the table, as for eating meat that's been sacrificed to idols, if you ever find some, it doesn't matter whether you eat it or not. It doesn't do anything. It won't harm your soul. It won't hurt your conscience. As for eating fish on Fridays, well, I kind of like that Wisconsin tradition of going to a supper club and having a fish fry. In fact, Carol and I went last Friday and had fish fry with some friends. As for what we eat this morning, let it be the promise and the mercy given to us through the bread and the wine. And when we come together this morning, let us meet Jesus in these things because, after all, we are very hungry for him. Amen.
I believe in God the Father Almighty, creator of heaven and earth. I believe in Jesus Christ, God's only Son, our Lord, who was conceived by the Holy Spirit, born of the Virgin Mary, suffered under Pontius Pilate, was crucified, died, and was buried. He descended to the dead. On the third day, he rose again. He ascended into heaven. He is seated at the right hand of the Father and he will come to judge the living and the dead. I believe in the Holy Spirit, the Holy Catholic Church, the communion of saints, the forgiveness of sins, the resurrection of the body, and the life everlasting. Amen. Dear Christian friends, confident that God hears us when we pray, let us offer our prayers for the church, the world, and all people in need. For those who speak your word throughout the church in the world, O oh God, and for, those, for educational institutions that prepared leaders, that you will lift up prophets in our congregations. We pray especially for the growing leadership gap in our own denomination. Help us all to identify leaders and help them realize their ministry gifts for leadership in our church. Let us pray. Have mercy, For the works of God revealed in and through creation, for an end to pollution and unjust use of natural resources, and for good weather this season, and for those who cannot afford sufficient heat or have no permanent shelter, we pray for all those in our own community who find shelter at the Salvation Army and Framed Presbyterian Homeless Program. Let us pray. Have mercy, O God. For the homeless, the unemployed, the underemployed, and their advocates, for the sick, the suffering, and their caregivers, and for the weak in body, mind, and spirit, especially London, Jim, Wayne, Rick, Brody, and Nate, we pray for Ed, Francis, Donna, Jean, and Luann. Bring comfort to Lula, Kevin, Judy, and family, that your compassion be felt by all in need. Let us pray. Have mercy. We also pray for those who have made their concerns known to us. At our annual meeting today, guide us to do your will in a way that is kind and caring for our brothers and sisters here at Trinity. And for Denise and family, on the death of her fiance, give them strength in days and weeks to come. Let us pray. Have mercy, O God. For those in our congregation celebrating special events, for those missing from our worship today, and for friends and family both near and far, especially those from Trinity that served our home in the military service, let us pray. Have mercy, O God. Into your hands, O Lord, we commend all for whom we pray, trusting in your mercy through Christ our Lord. Amen. Amen. The peace of the Lord be with you always. Please share with one another the peace of Christ. Peace be with you, brother. Peace be with you, Dave. Peace be with you.
us pray. Everything on earth and in heaven, O oh God, belongs to you. Thank you for making us stewards of your wealth. Bless these gifts we return for the sake of your ministry. Renew us by your grace, O oh God, as we come to your table to taste the sacred meal you have prepared for us. Amen. Amen. The Lord be with you. Lift up your hearts. We lift them to the Lord. Let us give thanks to the Lord our God. It is right to give our thanks and grace. It is indeed right, our duty and our joy, that we should at all times and in all places give thanks and praise to you, almighty and merciful God, for the glorious resurrection of our Savior Jesus Christ, the true Lamb who gave himself to take away our sin, who in dying has destroyed death and in rising has brought us to eternal life. And so with Mary Magdalene and Peter and all the, witness of the witnesses of the resurrection, we praise your name. You are holy, O God, most high. We praise you for all the blessings that you shower upon the earth and all of the things that you give us that we need for daily life. We thank you for the gift of the Holy Spirit that guides us in life and shows us the way. We thank you for your son, Jesus Christ, who offered himself for all of us. In the night in which he was betrayed, our Lord Jesus took bread gave thanks, broke it, and gave it to his disciples, saying, Take and eat, this is my body, given for you, do this for the remembrance of me. Again, after supper, he took the cup. He blessed it and gave it for all to drink, saying, This cup is the new covenant in my blood, shed for you and for all people for the forgiveness of sins. Do this for the remembrance of me. Our Father in heaven, hallowed be your name. Your kingdom come, your will be done on earth as in heaven. Give us today our daily bread. Forgive us our sins as we forgive those who sin against us. Save us from the time of trial and deliver us from evil. For the kingdom, the power, and the glory are yours, now and forever. Amen. Come, for now the feast is spread.
the body and blood of our Lord Jesus Christ strengthen you and keep you in his grace. Amen. Almighty God, we give you thanks that you have refreshed us through the healing power of this gift of life. In your mercy, strengthen us through this gift in faith toward you and in fervent love toward one another. For the sake of Jesus Christ, our Lord. Amen. We pray also, O oh God, that you care for those who are not with us this morning. We send those from this, this gathering to those who are ill and homebound with your word and your precious bread and wine. We ask that you strengthen them and nourish them as they participate in this blessed sacrament. Bring them comfort and peace through Christ our Lord. Amen. And now I'm going to pause and ask Kathy Trakti if she sees Jean Cunningham here yet. Oh, we're too early. Okay, we'll do it downstairs. <laughs> we'll celebrate Jean when she comes downstairs in, the, in a few minutes. The Lord bless you and keep you. The Lord make his face shine upon you and be gracious to you. The Lord look upon you with favor and give you peace. In the name of the Father and of the Son and of the Holy Spirit. Amen. Amen. Go in peace and bring God's love to the world in worship, witness, and service.